Out of the street corners they scream. You knew it was coming. You've been waiting for this for months. Rumor hardened into fear and now they scream at you. The sirens, their hysterical wail tearing through the white noise of the city. And you run. You run to pick up those things that can never be replaced. A picture of them in the days when they still loved you. Your mother's wedding ring. And then you turn to your shelf of games. You only have room for five. Five games for Doomsday. Five Games for Doomsday is a show in which board game personalities are thrust into a cabin in the woods to outrun an oncoming disaster, but can only take five of their games with them. But which will they choose? My guest this week has worked in many of the most recognisable RPGs in the industry, but especially with a penchant for the tentacular. Much of his work has focused on Chaosium's basic role-playing system, with work on World War Cthulhu, Acton Cthulhu and Call of Cthulhu, but he's worked on many other RPG properties too, including Battlestar Galactica and Game of Thrones, alongside work in the digital game space. My guest this week is Jason Dural. Jason, welcome to the cabin! Thank you for having me in this uh, post-apocalyptic world. Which, which, is not, which is not an ironic fantasy statement at the moment, which is slightly concerning. Well, I guess it's the, the, the pre- or the ongoing apocalypse, uh, sad to say. <laughs> and, and so my, my first question to people is usually this, which is how difficult was it for you to pick the five games to take away with you? Ah, yeah, it it actually is. I mean, because I think that, um, you know, I had to clarify with you that there would actually be other human beings playing with uh, there, so I didn't just pick five solo games. Um, And then some of it, too, was trying to come up with a balanced uh, list of games that would be the, okay, here's where we do, like, the deep gaming, and here is where we sort of just want something to pass the time idly, and here's a change of pace, and here's something that could... uh, expand based on imagination and whatever whim I had. So that was, uh, that was the basis of, uh, the decision making, uh, criteria that I set for myself. And I, I also decided that I would not pick any of, um, any games that I particularly have, um, written or directly work on. And now, um, you mentioned in the, my intro that I had worked on Call of Cthulhu, but a funny thing is I've worked on a large number of Call of Cthulhu adjacent games, games derived from Call of Cthulhu, but I have never actually like written something for Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu. And and it's what a kind of funny. What attracts you? Oh, what's that? To, as as a player, what attracts you to a particular game? Is it is it all setting? or theme, or are you, you know, intrigued by certain mechanics in role-playing? Um, I would say that um, as a, a writer-designer, I'm uh, sort of a um, double threat or double irritation when it comes to that. I find that the, the games that appeal to me most are the ones where the, um, the mechanics and the setting or the suggested um, uh, genre like work harmoniously together. And, um, you know, if I mean, there are games that I feel like the mechanics just sort of vanish into the setting, which is um, perfectly fine. Um, and, you know, they make for very smooth role-playing experiences, but there are all, and I'll talk about one of those later, but um, I find that systems in and of themselves, I, I, I don't find myself particularly attracted to, to games that are all system, all crunch, um, if that makes any sense. Like, and so generally it's, oh, I would say generally it's, it's a case of when there's a balance between um, system and setting, that that's the sweet spot that I like to inhabit. And setting can be something general, more like an aesthetic rather than a, you know, a, a like a setting or an environment and how do you think you would cope i think we're all getting a bit of a uh, we're all getting a bit of a dry run here but how do you think you would cope in the apocalypse can you skin a rabbit can you hunt an elk um i i don't know about skinning something as large as a rabbit or uh, as a rabbit or taking down an elk but i um 
when I was young, I actually spent some time out on my grandparents' farm. I was, um, as the oldest of three children, I was inevitably the one who was sort of shipped off to the grandparents to help them run their farm. And so I've done quite a bit of that kind of work. And so uh, also in college, I worked for summers at a uh, college's, uh, the physical plant, um, handling the college and various uh, uh, high schools and junior highs in the area. So I was frequently doing things like today I will apprentice with the locksmith to the next day I would work with the electrician, the next day the, the plumber. And so um, I, I, I think I'm fairly lucky in that I've had a fairly wide range of um, crafty type, um, you know, act, like physical jobs where I can manage to do the uh, mechanical stuff. Um, that said, computer technology flummoxes me to no end. Um, but yeah, I think I could actually handle it pretty well. I think in uh, college, I was, uh, I, I thought that my ideal job would be like working in one of those fire watch stations up in Alaska, you know, with just a little uh, apartment on top of a tower. So yeah, I think I'm fairly well, well equipped there. And, and do you relish that kind of manual work? Because I'm awful at it and I hate doing it. And so I've avoided it. I'm, I'm very well skilled for sort of lazy city life. Are you someone who, who likes to get under the sink and fix the plumbing and that sort of stuff? Um, I don't know that I would say I like to, but I, I don't shy from it. Um, other than, you know, oh, I have so many other things to do than, you know, take apart the plumbing assembly and, you know, muck out the... Uh, uh, sink crap. Um, but no, that, that kind of stuff I can do. And generally uh, you just reminded me I need to do. So. <laughs> well, you've got time yeah, at the moment. It's not a real problem. Yeah. So I, I want to, I want to go back to the beginning. What was your first contact with games? Did you grow up as a child submerged in games or did that come later? Um, I, I cannot remember. I, I mean, as, as far back as I can cast my memory, and that gets to, you know, maybe three or four years old, where I think that's a reliable memory as to, that's just a picture I remember. I, I can remember playing games, you know, like Candyland and um, Monopoly and, you know, all of these board games and uh, card games and, you know, dice type games were always a part of my childhood. They were, they were always things I asked for as for Christmas presents. And I, literally, I just can't remember a time where at some point my family and I didn't have boxes of games, you know, um, that were family activities. Or my, my sister, who is only uh, 10 months younger than me, she and I would play games quite a bit. And I would play games with my friends. So, um, my mother bought me a copy of um, Dungeons and Dragons out of the uh, the Sears and Roebuck catalog back when you know people did that kind of stuff. And this was not the earliest plastic bag edition of D and D, but one of the first boxed versions of it. Um, I think the date was 1978 or so. So, I mean, I'm I'm literally. My, my experience of role-playing games goes back um, um, 30, well, yikes, uh, 42 years. So yeah, I, I, I'm pretty familiar with these games. And, you know, I interview a lot of people on this, and they fall into certain schools. And, you know, you have the people whose first love was sort of Avalon Hill War Games. You have people whose first love was the sort of 90s revolution of Euro games. And then a lot of people talk about Redbox D&D and D&D &D being their sort of entry into the hobby. Mm. Were you immediately, when your mum ordered you that game and you got it, were you immediately sort of thunderstruck by D&D &D in a way a lot of people have been? Um, actually, and this, this will sound kind of contrary, I wasn't. Um, my, I was excited about it. I was enthralled by it initially. And then, of course, I, I designed my own dungeon and I tried to get the family to play it. And it was a complete and utter disaster. Um, no one enjoyed it. No one got the rules. They didn't understand, you know, the uh, it was a case of just like, what is this? Why are we playing this? And um, I, I was really disappointed. And it was only 
like, I think a few years later that I ran into some neighbors across the street and they were, they were literally playing Dungeons and Dragons out in their front yard and using their, they had a kind of an interesting rock topiary garden and they were placing their miniatures out amongst these little rock formations. And I was, you know, I, I had had D and D and I had no miniatures, like the idea of miniatures hadn't, uh, I hadn't seen them before. I didn't know. I, I would only uh, read about them in the, the rules. And I had no idea where would one buy miniatures. You know, I lived in rural Oregon, so it was um, not really something I could just go to the local game store or hop on the internet and order. So when I saw these guys, they had these brilliantly painted little figures and they were placing them down among the rocks of their mother's garden and you know, they had some uh, monsters. That was when suddenly I thought, oh, this is really cool. And so they let me play. And then eventually, even though we moved, I ended up joining another group of D&D players. But um, ironically, even though uh, D&D was sort of my entry to the uh, field, I've always regarded it uh, with a lot of ambivalence. Um, it's never been particularly enthralling to me. I always uh, went for games that were a lot more, um, uh, as soon as I got... Um, Stormbringer, which was it remains my all-time favorite RPG, I was captivated by you know the the amazing setting and the mechanics, which seems much more interesting to me. They evoked the the sort of fiction I was reading, um, like the Michael Moorcock stuff and um, other things like that, versus uh, D and D, which didn't really seem to reflect any fantasy I I read. And so, when did the world of horror gaming? enter your life because i my first contact with any rpg was call of cthulhu and i remember being absolutely enthralled instantly and completely you know completely obsessed with hp lovecraft thereafter when when did horror, horror games enter you um as in fact actually it uh, was pretty obviously um almost the same thing you talk about i was a big fan of um Stormbringer. And then, you know, there was a, when I bought Stormbringer, there was a little card in the back that said, please send this in to uh, sort of register to get our mailings from Chaosium. And, you know, little did I know how massively Chaosium would figure in my later <clears throat> uh, gaming and professional career. But I, you know, sent in my little card and I got a little mailer and that's how I got into RuneQuest and then uh, Call of Cthulhu. I had, um, I had read Lovecraft, a, a girl I knew in uh, high school. She had lent me um, the Lovecraft, those little uh, black and white uh, Michael Whelan painted uh, editions of uh, Lovecraft's work. And I was, you know, absolutely loved it. Um, and also, you know, I had been a big fan of Robert E. Howard and the Conan stuff. And so to me, you, you know, you could see the links between those cosmologies, you know, with some of the same names being represented there. And then um, as soon as I saw the Call of Cthulhu RPG, um, I immediately picked it up and was um, just, um, as you say, enthralled. I was, um, I had already been a huge fan of the, the basic role playing system because to me it was the most intuitive and the easiest to, um, to work with. I had already been doing some home brews where I had adapted Conan and adapted all these other uh, settings using those rules. And then Call of Cthulhu came and suddenly I was, I was like, oh, this is unbelievable. And I was really, really impressed by just the notion that um, there could be a game that wasn't about the kill, loot, level up, kill again, loot again. Uh, cycle of gameplay that I think is uh, the sort of default for a lot of fantasy RPGs. And, you know, the notion that all of your players could die at the end of a session, and that would be awesome. And so that was where Call of Duty really struck me, was the, the sort of wholehearted commitment to the, the rules of the setting and the genre itself. And so, yeah, I mean, that was that was very early. I think I was probably... Uh, picked up Call of Cthulhu the first year it was out, probably within the first six months. Which brings me on to your first choice, which is Call of Cthulhu. And, you know, I had I had Sandy Peterson on here, and it was, you know, 
as close as I've had to having someone in the gaming world who I consider a sort of celebrity, you know, shaking, this is very exciting. And Call of Cthulhu seems to be held in incredibly high regard and doesn't seem to be as divisive as D&D. It doesn't seem, even though it seems to me as iconic, it doesn't have those people who wish to distance themselves from it in the way that a lot of people do with D&D. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I mean, I think that there is uh, some degree of Lovecraftian fandom that, or rather Lovecraft gaming fandom or players that do actually try to distance themselves. Um, but, um, you know, I think that that's sort of a fringe. I think that ultimately the issue is, is that Call of Cthulhu um, does what it set out to do very, very well. And like chess and like checkers and like all of these amazing classic games, it has always achieved that goal very solidly. And, um, you know, most of the time when people talk about Call of Cthulhu, they are, you know, they're talking about like some, well, my tastes have changed towards rules mechanics. So I find this might be different or, oh, I find you know, something about Lovecraft's uh, beliefs or his personal character to be something I don't, uh, I want to distance myself with. But at the same time, there's this sort of unspoken acceptance that um, if you're looking at horror gaming um, in that uh, the, the Lovecraftian mythos, uh, this sort of science horror aspect, it's, it's Call of Cthulhu. And, you know, with with a great deal of, um, I think, apologies to many of the writers of all of the amazing, like, non-Call of Cthulhu games. I mean, you know, they're all sort of building on the, the pillar that is Call of Cthulhu, the, the RPG. And you talked about the, the basic role-playing system there. And I remember when I first played it, it seemed very intuitive you know it's percentages you need to roll under the percentages and you pass how sort of revolutionary in rpgs when it seems to me those early editions of D were incredibly labyrinthine not that i've played them but how revolutionary was the basic role-playing system when it came around do you think oh i mean absolutely the notion that um you know pretty much everybody characters and monsters could be treated the same mechanically that everything like your 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 chance to do something was always something as completely easily grasped as a percentage chance to to succeed either you can modify that but ultimately that's what it all boils down to and it struck me that um the uh percentage modifier at that time or the percentage roll at that time was ultimately the heart of every other RPG. I mean, if you're rolling for D&D &D and you're trying to, you know, early editions of D&D &D where you're trying to roll, you know, under a 15 or more, you're basically trying to roll a 75% chance. This was before, like, stat modifiers and all that came into play. Um, and so, you know, all of these... Uh, these games, like they struck me that uh, basic role playing, the, the system just basically stripped away all the weird abstract dice where, um, for example, like earliest versions of uh, d and I always thought it was weird that you, you know, you would sort of, you'd roll to hit with a D20, but if your thief was climbing a wall, he used percentile dice. And, you know, it was all of these, uh, you know, and if you were using psionics, I seem to remember they had their whole other weird system and so I found that um, ultimately, uh, you know, the basic role playing system just seemed to be the clearly the most uh, um, mechanically intuitive. It doesn't take um, a lot of explaining to to tell somebody, oh, you've got a thirty five percent chance of that. It's like saying there's a thirty five chance uh, percent chance of rain. They understand immediately what you're talking about. Whereas if you're saying something like, okay, well, you need to roll this D20 and add this modifier to that. And then if you break this particular other number, then that means you succeed or not. And, you know, like I, I like to calculate odds in my head. And I mean, there's a certain point where a lot of other game mechanics, uh, dice pools and whatnot are just, um, they escape my easy ability to do so. And I think that for many other people, you know, they, they just kind of go, okay, whatever, I'll just roll the dice. We'll see what happens. So 
this is ostensibly a board game show, so most people who listen to this are board gamers, but if so, if someone wanted to enter the labyrinthine world of Call of Cthulhu, mm-hmm. is there any sort of particular scenario, or any particular campaign that you would recommend to them to hop into? I would, and I mean, I say this not as a um, an employee of Chaosium, but the Call of Cthulhu starter set, which was released about a year and a half ago, is pretty much the the platonic ideal about how to get into um, Call of Cthulhu gaming. It is um, it has all of the rules for character creation. It's got a um, a summarized and incredibly functional version of the core rule book. Um, in that guide or in that box, it's got a solo adventure and it's got, I think two other adventures. One of them, I believe it has a copy of the haunting in it, which is one of the classic call of Cthulhu scenarios. And if it's not in that box, then it, um, it's freely downloadable on a chaosium site as part of the quick start. But, um, you know, that box has everything you need to get going. And it is an, uh, just, I would say, one of the best starter sets um, that, you know, you can buy. And that I can't think of an easier way to get into Call of Cthulhu gaming than that particular book, product. And I would so, say well, that no matter who was sending me uh, a paycheck every month. So I want to go on then and talk about, you know, you as a game designer, as a game writer. How did you how did you enter the professional world of game writing for RPGs? Um, that is a very um, interesting question. I was um, initial. I mean, I've always been a gamer, you know, developing um, like on my own, just as a fan. I've always been writing, uh, modifying rules, writing my own scenarios and campaigns and um sort of tweaking things, taking existing settings and adapting them to a particular set of rules or, um, you know, taking, uh, coming up with my own settings for existing rules. Um, and that's something that I've always done as a gamer, but, um, it was, uh, through ironically, um, uh, Amber diceless role-playing that got me got my toe in the water for RPGs. I had done a little bit of writing for some various fanzines, um, uh, along a wide range of uh, uh, games, like um, stuff for White Wolf's in Phobia, back when that was a, when they were actually print fanzines, and done a lot of fanzine type stuff, lots of little articles for uh, these things. And then I um, had bought a copy. I was living in Japan at the time, and I bought a copy of Dragon Magazine at a Japanese game and hobby store. You know, an English language copy. It was absurdly expensive, like. You know, 20, roughly around 20 bucks to buy a copy, but I had to have some sort of a gaming fix because I didn't really have a lot of gaming opportunities. I was teaching at a college in rural Japan. And, um, and then there was a, this little article or little advertisement for Amber Diceless role-playing, and I was a huge fan of the uh, Zelazny books. And so I sent my money, sent uh, extra money for postage, and I actually got a call from the... Uh, uh, from the publisher, Eric Wujic, and he was just so amazed that somebody in Japan had ordered a copy of his rule book, you know, and that was, I hadn't realized, you know, that Phage Press was basically one guy, and uh, he had, you know, literally, he got an order with a, in an envelope with a personal check and an address and a phone number, and so he, you know, called up the guy, he's like, is this the correct address, and I got a copy of the game and I was amazed and I instantly sent him back a huge fan letter and I just said, I love this game. I'm, um, if you ever want to, uh, if you're ever open for pitches for it, um, let me know. And so I ended up writing um, some of one of the, uh, the first of the Amber Diceless RPG source books, uh, a book called Shadow Knight. Um, and then I ended up writing another manuscript for him, but uh, the company basically collapsed before it could be published. And so um, that's, it's a book called Rebma and it sort of circulates in the internet as this great uh, uh, flying Dutchman of RPG supplements that, um, you know, we'll probably never get to actually see printed. But, um, and then I came to an AmberCon, um, one of the Amber conventions that they were doing. Um, this one was in Detroit and, um, 
I think I ended up running into a bunch of um, players that I really liked a lot. Amber has actually been an amazing thing in that many of the um, the most long term uh, and most significant um, interactions and uh, professional connections I have made have all come from the Amber community, which is really kind of amazing. Or going to these Amber conventions. And anyway, I met a bunch of guys who were working for some tech company in Texas and we hit it off and we kept running into each other at Gen Con and um, Amber Cons. I was flying to and from Japan for these uh, conventions. And then um, I ended up in Seattle. I was still doing a little bit of writing and then they offered me a job going down and working at a startup computer game company doing a MMO called uh, Shadowbane. And so that was the first transition where I had gone from a uh, being sort of, I, I was working in web development and uh, information publishing in the medical industry in Seattle at the time. Um, I left Japan and gone to Seattle. And then um, I packed up everything and moved to Texas to work as a full-time game designer and writer in the computer game industry. And from there, it was, um, you know, pretty much I became just a full-time gamer, um, working on computer games during the day and, um, you know, sort of freelancing and hobbying in the evenings, working with uh, a lot of other companies um, and, you know, writing stuff for various games such as uh, Guardians of Order, um, I think uh, Margaret Weiss Productions um, and so on. And so, yeah, from there, it's been uh, pretty much either a part-time or a full-time career ever since. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a kind of it was a kind of an experience where, you know, on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, my boss would come in and say, hey, we'd love for you to run a game tonight. Um, so I'm going to send you home early to prep. Do you think you could be ready to go at 7? <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> Uh, and, the fun days of computer game development. And and so you, you, you've written across many genres within the mm. hobby. Is it difficult to hop streams like that? Or are you quite adept at sort of moulding yourself to different genres? I, I think that I've gotten it down to a routine at that point. Um, there are very few genres that I haven't written for. And... Um, I find it's fairly easy to just sort of get myself into the mindset of a particular game. Um, I sort of take a step back and I, you know, try to remember and instill upon myself, like what, what drives this game? What makes players want to play it? What do they like about it? Um, what are they getting out of it? And I mean, once you've established that, then it's sort of a matter of like just putting on a different coat and saying like, and now I'm writing something set in, a space opera type of uh, setting or, um, for example, with a, a licensed property, like if I'm writing Serenity or um, Game of Thrones, I also find it's incredibly useful to go not just to look at the material itself, but to look at the sources of the material that the, the authors or the creative people found inspirational. And so that is usually a um, something that I think I'm... Uh, I quite enjoy and I think it adds a lot to the material, you know, like if I, when I was writing Game of Thrones, I just immersed myself in a lot of European history of, um, you know, prior, you know, to the, uh, the hundred years war and all that. And that really helped me get into the mindset of, okay, now I think I get this setting, but also I was more than familiar with a lot of the heroic fantasy, um, that, uh, George R. R. Martin likes. Um, he's very, very open about what his inspirations were. And so I was able to just sort of go through his reading list and go, okay, I see where this comes from. And, you know, you've done a lot of work with Cthulhu, Lovecraftian type stuff. When you, when you do that, what kind of creative freedom do you have? Can you cultivate your own voice or are you very much bound by the sort of Stygian prose of Lovecraft? Um, and this is where, you know, I think that the, uh, the reality of my, uh, my, um, CV when it comes to that, um, distinguishes itself is that most of the work I've done is in sort of this, um, adjacent to, uh, the call of Cthulhu setting. And so in that case, you know, like when we were writing, uh, World War Cthulhu, you know, that was a very sort of, uh, very prosaic, very sedate version of, 
not channeling straight um, Lovecraft, but more channeling like this is um, British World War II era, um, uh, the mindset. And it was a lot more inspired by spy um, material and espionage and um, actual uh, military action of the time, not necessarily tied to that sort of um, cosmic nihilism that uh, you find in you know pure Lovecraftian work. With uh, the laundry, you know, it was a lot more the weird office humor, the um, institutional um, malaise, and the uh, computer hijinks that you would get from uh, reading the Charlie Strauss novels that that was based on. Octung Cthulhu was just just crazy high energy. You know, what if? this sort of super pulpy version of uh, World War II plus Shoggoths plus some, um, you know, f- you know, street fights in um, the Elder Thing city in, uh, you know, at the base of the world in Antarctica and stuff that, you know, Lovecraft himself would have just blanched at. So I don't really find uh, uh, myself uh, sublimated into trying to emulate uh, Lovecraft. Uh, not so much at all. I think that that's perhaps one of the uh, the great things about that setting too is that it. Um, I mean, Lovecraft, you know, he 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 recognized, I think, quite late that it was a uh, a shared setting. But um, I think that there's plenty of flavors within it to the point where you could take um, you know elements of like the Dunwich Horror, which is uh, straight out. Um, uh, you know, there's a whole military action thing. And even the original story, Call of Cthulhu, there's a great deal of investigation and fighting cultists in the swamps of uh, Louisiana and whatnot that, um, you know, sort of isn't necessarily about this sort of singular horror that I think a lot of people tend to associate with Lovecraft. So your next game is one you've already mentioned, and this is the Amber Diceless role-playing game. So, first of all, defend to me an RPG without dice, because it seems like heresy. All right. Um, well, the um, I have actually spoken at great lengths to uh, you know the late Eric Wujic, who I consider to be a uh, mentor and um, and a friend. And when I was working with him on various products for the the line, um, I asked him why diceless, and he always explained to me that very early he had imagined that dice would be a part of the game. And that there would be a certain point where his design would mechanically require dice. Like he would just hit a point where he's like, okay, this is where this has to happen. There would be either dice or some sort of a token system. And he just never hit that. And so um, I think that the the game itself, and I mean, this is, um, I mean, ultimately this is sort of the purest definition of what you might call a role-playing game is you're playing a role. Um, the Amber Diceless game is basically a means of emulating the kinds of stories that uh, Zelazny wrote about with his Chronicles of Amber books. Um, in those books, characters don't die through like just crazy bad luck. You know, your character has a, of your character or one of Zelazny's characters, They are the, if not the masters of their own fates, they have um, sort of narrative shielding that will keep them from um, dying inadvertently. And so it didn't make a lot of sense for for Eric and I think for the game as itself too, when you're modeling these like immortal beings who can sort of pull experience, you know, they go, oh, and then there was that time I was a... uh, an ER surgeon in Paris in the 1920s and, you know, or, uh, you know, an operating surgeon or whatnot, or, you know, yeah. The, and then I studied sword fighting, um, in the 1700s in Spain for, uh, the better part of a decade. And so suddenly this character can exhibit these, some um, amazing sword abilities. And so he, he kept thinking, well, how do you represent that mechanically? And it almost became, um, uh, necessity to just do that narratively. And so the game basically, um, it turns into an exercise in pure role-playing and pure negotiation between the players and the game master. You have statistics um, and you have um, abilities that you, like magical abilities that are quantified, but for the most part, you sort of, um, 
you try to uh, uh, negotiate with people um, about like what the outcome of a particular action will be if two characters are fighting one another and their warfare skill, which is determines all combat, is equal or nearly equal, they're going to try to negotiate around one another and to the point where it would be, you know, they'll seek advantages, they'll try to trick the other. Um, if they are at a stalemate, then the smart move is to try to switch tactics. And so, like, if you are, um, you're matched in warfare with somebody and you're sword fighting with them and the GM is like, this is going to be, this is going to go on for a while. You're probably not going to be able to gain a significant advantage unless you try shaking things up a little bit. A player might say, well, I know I'm a lot stronger than this character, so I'm going to, I'm going to push in, try to get past his sword. I'll probably take a cut and then I'm just going to grab him and try to use my superior strength to, um, you know, like turn it into a wrestling match in which I know I can win. Or, you know, a character who is maybe outmatched in swordsmanship, but is much better at um, endurance and much more able to withstand punishment could be, I'm going to fight a defensive battle and I'm going to hope that I can eventually tire this uh, foe out. And so that's, I mean, ultimately, I think what the real heart of it is, is that it encourages a lot more tactical thinking um, and a lot more role playing because you really get into what your character is and what your character is thinking rather than from the inside, rather than sort of representing them in this sort of abstract mechanical fashion, the way that most games do, where, you know, you, you know, if you uh, are pitting yourself up against somebody and you are not succeeding, it's not because, you know, you rolled a crappy roll and they rolled a great roll, you know, because they're better than you. And there's a lot of that going uh, forward in the, uh, the Amber game. And that's uh, something I quite like. Um, the notion that it becomes an exercise in this sort of pure collaborative negotiated storytelling and gaming. And um, the other thing I find amazing is that um, with the game particularly is that um, Eric did something which he called uh, player contributions, which really encouraged players to get into their characters outside the actual gaming space. And, you know, to the point where they're writing poetry about their characters, they're drawing pictures of their characters or writing up sessions, um, sort of blue booking between uh, adventures and um, collaborating on, like, enriching the backgrounds of their characters in so many ways that I just don't see that very often in uh, other games. So I hope I've answered that question. <laughs> for you. I'm the, the, the way you describe it, it sounds a lot of the tropes, a lot of the goals seem to be very much what, for want of a better term, indie RPGs are trying to do. Indie uh, RPGs yeah, was, are, are very was, goal-based. Do you think this is a precursor to that? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, uh, Ron Edwards, who is one of the, uh, I would say, a pioneer in indie role-playing um, with his uh, Sorcerer and Sword, or Sword and Sorcerer, I can't remember the exact um, title, he um, has acknowledged the strong influence of Amber in uh, his game philosophies. I mean, if he's listening, um, I encourage him to reach out and correct me there. But uh, Amber does show up in quite a few uh, uh, instrumental, um, one of these instrumental influences in RPG development, um, even to the point where a lot of the uh, second generation, I would say, indie RPG people are being influenced by, by Amber without even realizing that's the case. And I do know for an absolute fact, because I gamed with them back in the day, that the designers of Fate, which was also one of the big indie RPG settings, came directly from Amber. They were looking for a way to add dice to their Amber experiences, and they came up, they ended up grafting Fudge onto that and uh, eventually coming up with Fate. Um, I, so... Yeah, I would say that Amber's influence on the indie RPG community is profound. So I want to take a bit of a deeper dive now, because into the Cthulhu genre, because it has been the great sort of dominating genre over board games and RPGs for the last sort of 10 years. In, in, in board games, I've seen it become, you know, very very big news. So, so firstly, what do you think it is about that whole Cthulhu thing that draws people in. I mean, it's it seems, you know, it's very nihilistic. It's essentially... It's essentially... D 
depressing. What, what is it about this that brings people in, do you think? Um, well, I mean, in a way, I would. I, I think you answered part of the question yourself there, where the, the nihilism appeals to people. I mean, and I mean, I don't know what that says about society, but this notion of this like coldly, cruelly indifferent um, mythology, I think, appeals to people at a, a very profound way. The other thing that I think is interesting is that, um, I mean, it sort of offers this array of deities and this sort of cast of um, mythological characters that is quite unlike anything most people have encountered, you know. And I mean, it, it's a it's a pantheon. It stands, well, I mean, who knows if in a thousand or two thousand years the, the answer will be there. But I mean, if you're looking at um, the sort of mythological creation, it I say that it stands uh, in prominence along with like the Greek gods or the Norse myths, you know, this sort of sense of this uh, weird cosmic scientific history of the world with all of these really strange monsters that sort of all of them address human fears of things that we find creepy, whether it's octopi or... um, you know, creatures that live under the ocean, this vast, you know, we, we keep hearing that we know less than, you know, two or three percent of the species that live in the deeps of the ocean. And so the notion of this, like, enormous part of the earth that is still a mystery to us is, um, I think that that sort of connects in a weird way. And the Lovecraftian myths, I think that they embody a kind of horror that, um, uh, a lot of the classic myths of, uh, or the classic horror tropes like werewolves or vampires have sort of lost their luster, you know, and <clears throat> some of it too, I think is, you know, I mean, zombies, I feel have gotten a little tired, even though they're still, um, they're still pretty useful as a, uh, a means of horror. But, um, I think that this kind of stuff too, with this horror, it loses something through over familiarity and, Lovecraft is still, for many, many people, still fresh. I mean, and a lot of what I would consider um, what people think about um, the Lovecraft stuff, they, they're they getting it secondhand. You know, they know Cthulhu, but they've never read the actual story. And I think the interesting thing is, is that you see this vast array of games and movies and even television series that, um, you know, dip into and pull Lovecraftian themes out. But at the same time, um, you haven't really seen this like major box office um, until uh, you know the color out of space. Um, I, there hadn't been, to the best of my knowledge, a, a big box office Hollywood film that uh, was like explicitly H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, I, I remember watching an episode of Supernatural, and suddenly they're talking about H.P. Lovecraft and. Uh, an episode of Riverdale, of all things, and then suddenly there's something about Arkham and. Lovecraft in that, and I was like, wow, that is really strange. But um, for the most part, I think it's still fresh. I mean, for people in the gaming space, um, particularly, you know, we've known Call of Cthulhu for 40 years, but for, uh, I think the appeal for many others is that it is still fresh and new, and it is a very broad and wide tapestry of um, things that you can add your own flavor to. It's, in many ways, too, an evolving myth in that I don't think it's still found the definitive like this is what Lovecraftian horror is um, other than you know Call of Cthulhu itself. Do do you think that Lovecraft's ethos sort of walks hand in hand with something like physics in that you know there is the old the old sort of anim, anim what's the word I'm looking for uh, sort of, there's the old gods that, you know, when we live in a particular country on a particular continent and we're very ground to the earth, that uh, it makes animistic. sense that gods animistic, yeah, that it makes sense that the gods interfere with our lives because our worlds are small. But when physics opens up vistas of distances that are incalculable to our brains, the idea of a god that is completely indifferent to our presence makes more sense to us. Um, yeah, I mean, well, like, you know, without getting too philosophical here, I mean, 
you know, one might look at the, the regular world and say it is really hard to imagine, you know, a, a benevolent guiding force in the universe, like particularly right now when we're dealing with an um, invisible plague that is uh, causing most of the world to just grind to a halt to try to prevent it. Whereas um, the notion of gods who are just so ancient and so old and so alien to us and that human life is just this sort of series of random accidents and, you know, a, um, basically an experiment for an alien race that is long since vanished from the earth. I don't know. I think that the, the sort of the, the dark ironic cynicism of that, um, appeals to many, you know, and, but then for others, I think it doesn't. I mean, um, I know people who play Call of Cthulhu as the, um, the notion that they are fighting, they are the, the glimmering of light in the darkness you know, they are making the good fight so that humanity will go down swinging. And I think that that's a perfectly valid way to um, experience the mythos. So, um, yeah, and I mean, that's if I might, um, you know, like dovetail back to uh, a previous comment um, here. That's one of the reasons that I think that Call of Cthulhu, the game and the basic role playing system are such a perfect match because the percentile dice system feels very cold and very much very unforgiving you know there's you roll you don't um you know at its purest sense you're not um you're not really you're subject to the mechanics that that happen and it's in a way almost the antithesis of amber where you know your fate is your own in call of cthulhu the dice roll and that's that's what the gods have decided that's the scientific um mechanical basis for how the universe works and um I think that appeals to people. When I when I talk to people about Lovecraft, I always I always ask them this question, and I I had Ken Height on here, and he was unequivocal in his answer. But is there a, an issue with Lovecraft, the man, and enjoying the work of Lovecraft? Um, I would say that anyone who um doesn't take a, uh, a strong look at Lovecraft, um, the man, and not see that, you know, he was a very, I mean, he was a brilliant writer, but he was definitely a person who had um, some very racist views, some very unapologetically, um, and I would say, un, like, into the modern sense, uh, some very unforgivable attitudes about people and about uh, cultures and races. And, um, like in this day and age, I, you know, perhaps he would have been slightly more enlightened, but I don't know. Um, but he certainly would have been a lot quieter about those opinions. Um, but in this case, um, with him, and I think with other writers, I think it's very important that one can take sort of this step back from him and distance him from the, uh, the work. And like he imagined that his, uh, you know, when he was writing these things, he called them uh, Yogg-Sothery, which is funny that, you know, the Cthulhu mythos is the actual, you know, the name that stuck. But um, he intended it for it to be a collaborative mythology, um, that others would contribute to it and draw from it, and that it would sort of evolve and take on form beyond his own contributions. And I think that that's one of the really important things to um, keep in mind when you're discussing or um you know, playing with the Cthulhu mythos is that it is not limited to Lovecraft, even by his own, you know, design. He encouraged people to take it and make it their own and to add to it and um, to, you know, like change it and mutilate it and um, do what, as he saw fit. At least that's my understanding of the way he... Uh, and and Christianize it in many ways, right? Um, in some cases, I mean, I think that he would have found that amusing, personally. I haven't seen much of his, uh, his view on that particular avenue. But I think that um, it's kind of, you know, it's a challenging topic, like looking at um, a creator whose works have gone far beyond them and trying to reconcile, like, how do we view this person who is long dead um, how do we appreciate their work knowing what we know about who they were and how they believed? And I, I don't think I'm, uh, you know, qualified to make a, a decision about how we should approach Lovecraft. I think that every individual person does. 
I know that um, Chris Spivey, who did Down Darker Trails, or uh, not Down Darker Trails, uh, Harlem Unbound, sorry there for the glitch, um, he, you know, wrote a book very explicitly um, with a team of writers um, dealing with the issues of Lovecraft's racism and how that um, impacts uh, um, basically being a black gamer in America and having to deal with the notion of, I really love this setting, I'm really deeply immersed in, you know, Call of Cthulhu as this game and this world, and yet how do I reconcile the fact that, um, you know, he was racist, you know, just unapologetically Lovecraft was a racist. And so I think that that was actually a pretty brilliant uh, piece of piece of game scholarship and playable game material and that it sort of dealt with that uh, topic. And I think that, um, I think that's a wonderful way to approach this kind of thing, if, especially regarding the Lovecraftian mythos, if, if you have a problem with Lovecraft, and many, many people do, I mean, address that. Um, if you're not comfortable with the cosmic nihilism of some of his stories, write something that is, um, that, you know, opens it up and gives a glimmering of hope in the world. There's, there's room for all of that. So your next game, then, is a, another towering Chaosium title, and this is King Arthur Pendragon. <laughs> What's special about this game? Well, I would argue that it is the absolute perfect synthesis of game mechanics and setting. It um, takes the basic role-playing system, which I was already a huge fan of back in the day, and it boils it down into an even simpler version of it. Um, I think that one of Greg's uh, bit of geniuses with that, um, Greg Stafford, the, the creator of RuneQuest and publisher of uh, Call of Cthulhu and Pendragon and many other fine games that he, um, you know, I think he understood that um, at that time that D and D with the D 20 was a very um, like a lot of people liked rolling D twenties. I think that for Pendragon, it feels very different. Um, you know, he could have done it as a personal dice system, but he chose not to. And I think that it actually feels right for that game to be using a D 20. I think that the introduction of passions, and um, personality traits uh, actually codified within the game is absolutely brilliant. Um, instead of something that um, is uh, uh, abstract as experience points, I mean, characters gain abilities based on successful use of skills, which I actually love. But also, um, rather than experience points, your success in the world is measured by renown, which I think is an absolutely... Um, perfect idea that the more renowned a knight you are, the better people know you and the more they, uh, more respect you gain in the world, which is really effective that, I mean, you can be an awesome warrior, but if you are not renowned, you are not necessarily as uh, successful as being a knight. And so um, I loved that. I loved the fact that it was very, very tight and focused, you know, in the earliest version of the game. I mean, you basically were your Arthurian knights, your new knights. There's not a lot of, um, well, you can go be a shape-changing werebear, or you can, um, you know, take on the role. You can be a Celtic scald, and you can be a, a you know, you can be a, a, say, a French, um, a Celtic warrior. They they really sort of, like, dealt, dialed that down to, this is the particular type of character you're playing, this is the world. These are the types of adventures you will play. And I found that very, um, I mean, in a way, very refreshing to find that you didn't have to try to accommodate for all these manners of input, like players coming in from all these different vectors and having all these different uh, uh, goals and um, gameplay styles. And that it was very much a, a, we are going to offer a particular and distinct type of experience here. Um, and that is what we offer. We are not going to um, broaden that by trying to accommodate every taste. And I think that that actually has a lot of appeal. Um, and so I just absolutely tore up um, Pendragon. I thought it was amazing. Played through pretty much everything that they initially released for the game in the first wave before I shipped off to college. And then my uh, gaming was kind of at a minimal period for a few years then. And, and where does and, um, this... Oh, carry on. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Continue. Uh, where does this rank 
in the pantheon of great RPGs? I mean, I would put it, um, I mean, if not in the top three, in the top five. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, in RPGs, I would consider, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, obviously, for its longevity and its um, uh, appeal and just the, the fact that it is kind of foundational to the, 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 like, you can't say RPGs without indirectly referring to Dungeons and Dragons. The game itself doesn't appeal to me that much, but I recognize it's... Um, its fundamental importance to the industry. I think Call of Cthulhu is another. I think Pendragon. And then after that, I start to go, well, Vampire? Um, And then, you know, you start thinking of games that maybe might be, you know, in one of these top five, but are arguably there. I mean, for me, the other one would be the Star Wars RPG, the original uh, West End Games one in terms of games that are absolutely like everyone should know these games, everybody should play these games. So I want to talk now about awards, because when you sent me your bio, when you sent me your bio, you mentioned that you'd won a few any awards. So so firstly, can you tell us what awards you've won and what you won them for? Um, I, well, every, I should say, first and foremost, any award um, that I've gotten has been in collaboration with some um, amazing creative people and in working with games that are created by teams. And so, you know, um, just saying I have won an award is, I should, you know, elaborate on that. And then I should say, I took part in a product that won an award. Maybe I was the name at the top of the uh the credits list on that product, but um, I don't ever want to uh, take all the credit for anything. Um, the most recent, um, I got the, uh, or rather Jeff Richard and I and Greg Stafford got the um, any the gold any for best uh, downloadable, I think, product for the RuneQuest Quick Start a couple of years ago. And then um, I received the uh, I think it was the silver any for the best GM screen or best GM supplement for the Conan RPG. Um, and then RuneQuest, uh, uh, role-playing in Glorantha, RQG as we call it, um, received the gold for um, best art, I believe that was the title. And so those are the any's I've received. And apparently I've gotten a I've been associated with products that have gotten a couple more, but I'll, um, like, I think one of them was a Serenity title, um, or, uh, yeah. And, oh, for Big Damn Heroes, for Serenity, the RPG, I was part of the team that made that happen. And, um, I think there was one more, but I can't remember. And these were, um, when I was only sort of peripherally as a freelancer and getting an any, or rather being on the list of names for a product that received an any was more of a, Oh, interesting. Um, so it was only in the last handful of years that I made myself a full-time professional game developer that I, um, I started keeping track of that kind of stuff. So I'm embarrassed to say that I, I haven't been an absolute, uh, any, uh, follower year by year. And and for those who don't really know much about the Any Awards, how well regarded are they in the role playing world? Are they the Oscars for role playing games? Um, I would say, I mean, they're definitely well regarded. Um, I would say that um, along with the the Origins Awards, and um, you know, there there aren't that many major awards RPGs are. Uh, given, but I would say that they're fairly high regarded. I mean, it's certainly a, a it's certainly something that any game that receives a, an award like that or any creative type who gets to uh, who gets one should feel proud about. And um, I think that it is a selling point for many games. I mean, it certainly raises the uh, the profile of any game that gets on the short list. So yeah, I would say it's quite important. And then there's the um, you know, the, the sort of rarefied uh, Diana Jones Awards, which I would almost consider to be the Director's Guild Awards, which are kind of off um, in the, uh, the much more secretive and perhaps less publicly uh, known, but are equally as important to people in the game development industry. And, and does winning an Emmy or something like this, does it help you professionally in the, in the sense that, you know, 
you win an you win a best actor Oscar, and that that makes you for life. Is this the case with something like an any award? Does work come does work come in when you win an award? I I don't know about the um, makes you for life. I mean, there you know there are plenty of actors who have won best actor awards who. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that it uh, changed their lives in a, a dramatic way, but, um, but no, I think that it helps. I mean, but only really, I, I think, and this might be a uh, sort of mercenary to say, but I think that in many cases, the issues of whether or not you're going to be successful in the RPG industry depend primarily on issues like how easy are you to work with, you know, how, um, how high a quality of work there is, you know, like it, if you turn in work, it doesn't matter if you've won in any for like best, uh, best supplement for an RPG. If you turn in work and your editor looks at your, your material and goes, Oh, I have so much work to do here. I can guarantee you that the editor is not going to be thinking like, Oh, well he, you know, he or she won in any. So therefore I, I want to use them above all else. I think that um, the quality of the work is paramount and, just being cool to work with or being good to work with. Those are um, primary. So I would next... say um, being reliable, but I, I have, you know, frequent problems with deadlines. So I would <laughs> never uh, bring that up as a, uh, as a requirement. And, and so your next game then is probably the most famous of the indie RPGs. And this is Fiasco. And this is, this is wildly different. When you first came to Fiasco, were you blown away by just the concept of it? Uh, yeah, I would say. I mean, I had um, been, I played a little bit of and um, it quite enjoyed Primetime Adventures, which... Um, I feel is a sort of a precursor to um, uh, fiasco in that it sort of regards the the notion of playing an RPG as a, akin to playing through a, a television series. And um, I, I like that abstract lens of um, that. And I actually enjoy primetime adventures primarily as a, a structuring device for how to put together a campaign and, um, not necessarily so much as actually playing it as a game of its own. I think that it has a lot of uh, mechanics that are sort of, you can pull out and use at a larger sense in almost any sustained gameplay. So I was sort of primed to um, like that so that when Fiasco came around, I, I was, I recognized a lot of that similar DNA and also, you know, to be honest, a lot of the Amber DNA in there, um, and so I, I suppose I was predisposed to liking that. So, so what is it you think that Fiasco does well? Um, I think that Fiasco is amazing in that it sort of lets you um, play without the, the um, hierarchy of your, like one player is the game master and they are the, um, the sort of ringmaster or the ultimate arbiter of what happens, which I think in many cases is a, tacit understanding most players playing conventional RPGs or even unconventional RPGs come into, they think, oh, you know, one player is basically calling the shots, you know, they can be an un, um, uh, sort of an unbiased arbiter of rules mechanics, but, you know, the game master decides if your player characters are having a fight with a group of town guards, the GM can just decide, well, then 10 other town guards show up and overpower you. And, you know, regardless of how the, the dice go, you know, the game master basically has all the cards. And in Fiasco, it turns every player into an equal in collaborating. And I like the, um, the sort of the mechanical structure of it in that it invites this sort of crescendo of disaster that oftentimes feels like it's spiraling out of control, but usually almost always comes in for a horribly awkward, perfect landing. And, um... The other thing I've got to say about um, Fiasco is that it seems to be incredibly approachable for people who have never played an RPG before and maybe never would play a traditional RPG before. And I have almost never played a, uh, a game of Fiasco, and I've played dozens and dozens of times. I've never played one that wasn't absolutely hilarious, and which is, I think, an unintended side effect that the game almost inevitably ends up being these, you know, absolutely quite funny experiences. 
I kind of wonder what it would be like to play a, a dark and grim uh, game of uh, fiasco, but so far I have not had the experience of doing that yet. So I want to go on now and talk about the future. So what do you have coming in the future that we can have access to? Um, well, um, the future. Well, I, you know, the, uh, I think that the interesting thing, I mean, about this, um, the fact that, you know, much of America is, and the world, I, I should, I don't know why I preface this with America while I'm sitting in Berlin, but, um, much of the world is sitting inside right now. We're quite a few people who have the means or are furloughed or are, um, currently now unemployed and, you know, or at home and are looking to games and escapism as a means of, um, uh, you know, just encountering each other and interacting with each other, but whether within their uh, family units or their, whatever their household arrangements are, or with people across their areas, you know, whether, you know, you're gaming online with people that you normally game with in physical space, or if you're gaming with people all over the world, which in um, many cases I've seen, I'm, you know, playing games that, you know, we've got people dialing in from the United States, whereas I'm in Europe. And so, you know, um, I think that we're going to see a lot more gaming um, that is uh, basically keeping this in mind, this notion of um, distributed online play, where you basically are playing with these, uh, these weird constraints of, okay, um, you know, maybe traditional dice-based, character sheet-based, um, combat-centric games, which play well at a table, you know, games with a battle map or whatnot, um, whereas they don't always necessarily work with uh, uh, online gaming. I mean, there are some virtual tabletops, but, um, I mean, most of the gaming that I'm seeing is people using things like Google Hangouts and Skype and Discord and, um, you know, Microsoft Teams or even uh, Slack to play games in. And I think that that's a... um, a very interesting uh, evolution of what's happening in gaming right now at this moment. Um, And so I think that um, you're going to start seeing a lot of games that are sort of aimed at this uh, smaller group, um, more casual to run, um, better for like one-on-one or um, uh, like non-physical proximal space. Because unless I'm wrong, and it could be, I think that almost every RPG, you know, published with very few exceptions sort of works on the assumption that you're all going to be like in a space at the same time together, you know, like actually looking at each other, interacting with one another, either from the comfort of um, some couches in a living room to a table with a uh, hex or a square grid upon it. So, um, I think that we're going to see a lot more games like that and um, that sort of emphasize that you don't have to be all together to play. And I think that's pretty cool. I think that you're going to see a lot of online tools being developed as part of the absolute uh, assumption that if a game is going to be released, it should have some um, methods for playing it online. And I think that's pretty interesting. And so what does that mean for you as the game designer? then does that change um, your role i think that um somewhat but then like i say i'm coming in i mean if you can um glean from the the background information i've talked about i got a pretty wide range of influences and for example like amber diceless role-playing is an absolute perfect game to play on uh you know on like on a voice-based or video-based chat. And so I think that I have a unique skill set, perhaps, in that I sort of bridge the almost systemless gaming with some of the more crunchy, you know, tactile, tactical gameplay. And um, my background in computer game design, of course, is, gives me a lot of very specific um, uh you know, like you end up with a certain set of skills that are very, very crunchy that are based on, you know, trying to design systems that a coder will have to program that work. And if they don't work, you don't have a game master sitting there who's ready to wave their hands and go, okay, then, you know, move on. Let's just keep going. When you're designing a computer game system and there's a problem, you know, a server can crash or a 
a client can crash. There, there can be a very dramatic error that um, can cause ripple effects. And especially if you're dealing with microtransactions, you have the options of um, screwing up a table in, or a system can end up costing people a phenomenal amount of money or, um, you know, uh, creating enormous problems that create data corruption. So I'm pretty skilled at dealing with uh, also these kind of very tight, very crunchy uh, uh, game systems. So I would say that my own, um, I don't see it having a huge impact on, you know, the kinds of games I work on and whatnot. Um, I mean, I'm working with Chaosium now, um, principally, and we have um, new products that we're talking about, um, both, you know, at the level of crunch as a game like RuneQuest and some games that are considerably lighter and more uh, approachable for a newcomers or um, adaptable to this kind of uh, uh, atmosphere of playing distributed, you know, with uh, through your computers with each other. And so I hope that makes it, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there a dream project that you would love to work on? If money were no object, if time were no object, is there something that you'd really love to do? That is a, um, I don't know. I mean, the funny thing is, is I can think of a lot of sort of dream projects related to IPs that I would absolutely love to take a crack at. Um, you know, some of these, but I, I sometimes wonder, like, is there any commercial appeal to that? Um, one, one, one of my favorite books in the universe is uh, The Worm Ouroboros by um, uh, Eric Rucker Edison. It was a classic of fantasy that um, Tolkien read, you know, and had some problems with. But um, it's one of these, like, um, epic, towering novels of fantasy that almost no modern readers have read. And I would love to do an RPG on something, you know, like set in that world. But I think that that might appeal to, say, a few hundred people overall, which is not really a, a, a model for a successful RPG. Um, I think also that I have been phenomenally fortunate enough that I have been able to play in the sandboxes of a lot of um, my favorite genres and writers from you know, the Cthulhu mythos to Robert E. Howard's Conan world. Um, I've written, you know, stuff for Battlestar Galactica that was published online when the RPG was coming out. Um, I've done some stuff for the Guardians of Order Game of Thrones RPG. Um, uh, just a wide range of the, and Serenity, the, uh, you know, Firefly universe, um, and quite a number of other um, interesting IPs. And so, um, Ultimately, one thing I would love to do sometime, if, if you could tell me, like, what would be the thing that you would love to do more than anything, um, it would probably be something superhero-ish. I think that there is a, uh, that um, right now, um, I think that there's a, a few, like a gaping hole in the um, pen and paper industry in that um, no one seems to be doing anything with Marvel. And I've been reading, and it might be for various licensing reasons, but... Um, I've been, you know, reading Marvel comics and enthralled with the Marvel superheroes since I was like five. And so I would love to do something with uh, that Marvel comics uh, universe overall. Something I've never gotten the chance to do. So your last game then is your only board game on the list. And this is Azul. Why are you taking this to the cabin? Yes. Um, well, because it's just a gorgeous game. It is... Um, it is. It has a tactile feel to it. The weight of the 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 tiles themselves. Have you played it? Okay. Yeah. I, I. I. You know. I find it sort of like dominoes or mahjong in that it it has a very distinct feel to it that I, I love. I, I like the fact that the tiles have a little bit of weight to them. The whole drawing tiles out of the bag thing feels great. The aesthetic of it and sort of the zen. There's a little bit of zen to it, and that you're just sort of trying to create these patterns. It's a very soothing game, but at the same time, there's a tactical level where you're trying to um, draw the right tiles for yourself or perhaps screw over the, you know, you're thinking multiple draws in advance. Like if I take this one, if I'm the first one to draw out of the center, then that means that person is going to get penalized. And so I like the fact that it is ultimately at heart a very, very simple game, but you can play it um, 
in a, a number of different ways and that it is, um, uh, I would say, a, uh, it's one of those games that almost anyone, once they figure out how to play, can have a great time doing that. And, you know, life is not all about RPGs. Sometimes you want to just have a game where you can just sort of play and casually um you know, enjoy your time together. And I think that it's important to have a balance there. And my my list of five was also very specifically geared so that it wouldn't be all about um, the dynamic of one player having to game master, whereas everybody else sort of is their, uh, their captive audience. And Fiasco, for example, I picked that because ultimately if you're uh, able to, uh, you know, come up with your own play sets, you can pretty much create any kind of game or setting that you'd like. So Azul is the one that I think is sort of the peacemaker game. And if there are any children involved in this, uh, you know, um, hiding out at the cabin, I think that that's a good game for younger players as well. And so is there anything that RPG designers can learn from board game designers and vice versa? Um, yeah, I think that there is, um, that first of all, um, aesthetics matter. I think that that is primary. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the notion of, uh, RPGs are not just, um, these sort of intellectual experiences that there's a certain point of like, what does the game look like? What is the whole package of the game? And some of this is a publishing issue. Some of it is a desktop design issue or a graphic design issue, but, um, this notion of like, how can we um, present a coherent package? And as an editor, I'm always telling my, my writers, I'm like, when they hand me, you know, uh, they send me files and I go, oh my God, there are like 700 consecutive paragraphs, you know, like 700 consecutive words in this section with no subtitles, no section breaks, no sidebars. And they're like, what, what? And I said, just imagine, you know, that this is just going to be a wall of gray on a page, you need to figure out a way to break this, you to keep, you know, so that it's not every section of your work is a, uh, is a marathon. And I think that it's important to um, consider the aesthetics of a, uh, a gaming experience. And for example, most of the really successful board games have these very strong visual appeals to them. You know, some sort of a central metaphor that, um, you can grasp easily and come into it. And that is, I think, something that uh, board gamers do have to, um, uh, that some of the best board games can teach RPG designers. So one last question then. You're heading off to the cabin sure. somewhere in Brandenburg. And right. you go around the corner, 88 miles an hour. The back door flies open. Four of the games fly out down a ravine into a river and are swept away to eternity. Which game do you hope is sitting on the back seat of the car? Um, well, I would, um, I would probably pick Pendragon, actually. And I'm only deciding this right now, looking at the list that I typed up. And, um, and I'm going to, here I'll throw in some ultimate cosmic um, doom and gloom, but I think that if I imagine that this, um, the doomsday comes and that um, humanity is destroyed and that maybe if some archaeologists from some human civilization to come or aliens arrive on this planet and try to sift through what's left, and I would like these... Um, future uh, archaeologists or anthropologists or surveyors to find a game like Pendragon and go, you know, that was really interesting. There's some history there. There's some, um, it embodies these noble traits. So yeah, I think I would go with Pendragon. I would say also Pendragon is the game that I think um, generally makes people feel pretty good when they play, whereas, um, you know, Call of Cthulhu, the nihilism of... Uh, living through a post-apocalyptic setting while playing in the with the cosmic nihilism of Lovecraft might be a little dark. So if people want to get hold of you or they want to see what you're up to, what you've got coming out, how could they go about doing that? Um, well, I'm on uh, Facebook, I suppose. Um, and I don't actually have a personal website. It's uh, never seemed like a high priority at the time. Um, uh, you can always look to chaosium.com and projects I am working on are there. Um, I just finished a uh, four-year stint as the line editor for the modifious um, Conan Adventures in an Age Undreamed of, 
RPG, and I think that the products related to that are still coming out. They're being released in PDF while we're waiting for the, uh, the print and distribution world to straighten out. So there's a pretty steady stream of that. But ultimately, um, either looking me up on Facebook or um, uh, chaosium.com or checking the Chaosium website um, under Facebook, those would be the ways to go. I don't uh, participate in Twitter, so... Um, you won't find me there unless somebody's talking about me, which I mean, might be the case. I don't know. Um, and I suppose if you wanted to talk to me about any sort of uh, chaosium related matter, you could just reach me at jason at chaosium.com, which is easy enough to keep in mind. Brilliant. Jason Durrell, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. That was, that was great. Okay. Thanks. I hope I didn't blather too much. You can support the show in many ways. You can tell your friends. You can talk about it on social media. You can talk about it on your own blog, podcast or video. Or you can support it directly by going to patreon.com forward slash 5G for D for a rolling donation or for a one-off donation hitting the PayPal link at the bottom of the website 5gamesfordoomsday.com. It's these donations that keep the show going. Also, if you want to say something nice about the show, or if you want to say something horrible about the show, you can contact me on Twitter at 5 games for Doomsday, or send me an email at 5 games for Doomsday at gmail.com. And if I've managed to bat away the tentacles and pull myself away from the void, I'll see you in two weeks for another 5 Games for Doomsday. <laughs>